Is there any critic that the climate science community is prepared to respect? So people like Schellenberger and Lomborg will kind of almost claim that this is obvious that we can get continue this right and in fact i'm sure that they almost say it like that right you know look at us we're so brilliant we can you know we can keep this going and i'm thinking I'm, we're not the problem people have is i don't think we're convinced we can because i think you're underestimating how much potentially warming the planet by four degrees will do I am delighted to be joined by Professor Ken Rice, who is Professor of Computational Astrophysics at the University of Edinburgh, but also runs the influential long-running blog And Then There's Physics. He is a commentator on climate change and climate science communications, as well as also he's been involved in some aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic. So, lots of things to talk about. Ken, thanks so much for joining me for this discussion. A pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. We're talking just a few days after the release of the IPCC AR6 Part 1 report. We've seen the report itself, we've seen how it's been discussed in the mainstream media, as well as on social media. So, Ken, what's your headline take on what we've seen over the last few days? My headline take is that I think they're being more definitive about things than they maybe were in the past. So things like it being unequivocal that we are causing global warming. I think some of the comments about extreme events of, of stronger heat waves, precipitation, if I remember correctly, some, some of the droughts, um, maybe some of the flooding, although maybe that's still a little bit less certain. Um, so it does seem to be making stronger statements about the human causation than maybe was the case seven years. I mean, it was still relatively strong seven years ago. It wasn't like they were, you know, weren't all that sure. But I think they're, they're making stronger statements this time, which I think is good, because I think that's been pretty clear for a while now that that's the case. And I guess they've also narrowed slightly this climate sensitivity range, which is interesting, because that was always a big thing. You know, is it, it's been 1.5 to 4.5 or something like that for since the Charney report in 1976, if I remember the year correctly. And now if I remember the numbers, they've gone from, you know, the likely range is something like two and a half to four or four and a half now with a best estimate of three. And in the previous uh, AR5 report, they, they chose not to present a best estimate. So they've gone back to presenting one. So I think those are the headline figures that I've seen, which I think is quite interesting. Those are things that people who actually read the detail of a report find significant. I think from the point of view of people who see such things through the filter of the mainstream media, they've been seeing some screaming headlines on some fronts saying that the end of the world is nigh and all of that. There hasn't been any change through the filter of the mainstream media. The things that you just mentioned weren't especially talking points the way the issue's been talked about, they weren't previously conveying a huge amount of uncertainty in the headlines and the way they were talking about it. So you could excuse people for reading those stories and asking themselves, does this mean things are going to be worse? Does it mean it's going to happen sooner? What do we know now that we didn't know before? I think if you spoke to, say, more clam, and some of them did post some amusing comments about this, I guess, on Twitter and places where... It hasn't changed that much, right? You know, yes, we've become more confident. Yes, we can make stronger statements about some extreme weather events. Yes, we've narrowed the climate sensitivity range, but actually the best estimate's pretty much the same as it was at the AR4, you know, 14 years ago. So a lot of climate scientists would say, actually, yeah, the, the picture is broadly the same as it has been for quite some time now. You know, we're causing climate change, we're warming, the rate of warming is roughly what we expect it to be. We're clearly influencing some extreme weather events. We probably expect to get more confident about the other ones as well over time as we get more data, as the models get better, et cetera. So I guess in some sense, it's maybe good that the media is, you know, people in the media, or rather, if you observe it from the perspective of the media, you're not seeing much of a change. So I don't think <laughs> overall the big picture has changed greatly. You know, maybe the details are getting clearer. Maybe some of the things we're more sort of certain about, but, you know, essentially the basic picture is roughly the same. One of the details people have been talking about on climate Twitter and elsewhere has been the scenarios yes. <laughs> and the ongoing question, which is that from previous reports, we've had this a number of scenarios that are painted to explain what will happen depending on what we do. From the most optimistic, 
to the most pessimistic possibilities. And then there's always this knotty problem of where do the headline writers draw from? And of course, in a world where the media runs on advertising and they want as many clicks as possible, of course, they go to the worst case. And you and I know historically that as RCP 8.5, the vision of what would happen if we suddenly decided to burn twice as much coal rather than cutting down. The critics have said that this is an unhelpful focus because it's unrealistic and it also puts fear into the hearts of people, not least those of children, eco-anxiety. What's this report, the AR6, brought to that discussion? So, so I think even in the previous report, despite what you might see on social media, they were more cautious about how they described it, right? They even had a glossary item about the term business as usual has gone out of favor because what does it mean to follow a business as usual pathway, right? You know, because it's constantly changing. So so I think even, even despite, you know, despite what some critics have said, I think people have tried more to be more careful about how they present that and you do have as you say you've got a sometimes a slight disconnect between how the media might present it and how there's not everyone i will admit there's still been some who've, who've used the terminology poorly but i think this report has been more careful about how they describe that i think it's more like a high warming or a high emission pathway Plus, the other thing they've done, and again, I haven't looked at it in detail, is they've tried to present things more in terms of what happens if we warm by one degree or two degrees or three degrees or four degrees, rather than as in terms of these sort of concentration pathways. Because it is the case that even if you take, um, if you look at the papers like Zeke Housefathers and Glenn Peters' papers and things that said, you know, this is the pathway we're probably on based on, you know, current policy and, and you know, planned policy. And if you then project that to 2100, it was something like three plus or minus one degrees was the kind of warming you might expect along that. So even though, you know, we, we've possibly got to the stage where the highest emission pathway is no longer likely, no, sorry, it's never been likely. It's now extremely unlikely, more unlikely than it was. You still can't rule out those levels of warming of say four degrees or maybe slightly higher, even if we followed one of the sort of more likely pathways. And I think they've tried to present things more in that way, which I think is better because that's sort of what interests us, you know, you know, what happens if we warm by one or two or we've warmed by one already. So, you know, two degrees or three degrees or four degrees. Um, the other thing I was going to say, and I just left my mind now, what was it again? Oh, that's right. I was also going to say that, that of course, it's some, in some sense that the WG1 report, the physical science report, is not is trying, I think, as much as they can to not assign probabilities to these pathways, right? Because that's not their job to tell us, you know, sort of what should we do or not what, what should we do? What are we probably going to do? It's more like saying, you know, here are the range of pathways. And it is true that the high end pathway is now extremely unlikely, extremely and unlikely. And indeed the very you. lowest pathways but, as well. And indeed the very lowest, exactly. But I think it's still useful to bracket things in terms of, look, this is the worst case. And in a sense, this is what we've avoided. <laughs> and maybe on the low end, this is where we could have been had we you know, done more in the last decade. And then everything in between is sort of within the range of what's, what's now plausible. And so in a sense, it's the other reports and maybe policymakers and us to determine you know, more definitively which pathway we actually follow. So I think they, they, they are, I think, relatively careful about not trying to assign a probability to these pathways and just present them as this range of futures, one of which now may become much less plausible. And as you say, on the other end, the low end, it's also become much less plausible. So we kind of have, in a sense, much less plausible outcomes on either side with the, the middle being hopefully, no, not hopefully, because I hope it's even better than that, but, you know, being where we are probably heading at the moment. So... On the communication side, we had a contribution a few days ago on Twitter, which I know you saw, and I'd be quite interested to get your take on. Dominic Cummings, the former Brexit guru, the former chief advisor to the prime minister, surely everyone knows who Dominic Cummings is. He tweeted this. Tip for those who want to persuade people on average slash below average incomes on net zero. Saying, oh my God, look at today's weather, the world is ending, will not work. Please learn from vote leave and figure out what works before you blab it. Does he have a point? He probably does. But I think so. Let me I was thinking about this a bit before uh, we, 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 we got together today, you know, I'm a scientist, that, that's the perspective I come from. And, I, and clearly, 
I'm engaging in this sort of discussion or this communication or this engagement because I think it's interesting. But I do find, because I think it's important. But I do find it interesting. But I always think of it in terms of what information is interesting or useful, right? That's that's to me. And what's what information can I say that I can support with evidence, right? That I can actually, if need be, find a paper or refer to the IPCC reports or something, right? And so I always feel, and this is my bias in a sense, that I start from that perspective. And then maybe you think a little bit about how do I present that to a particular audience, right? How do I, you know, how do I, how do I sort of say this in a way that I think will maybe appeal, but, you know, maybe be clearer to a certain audience. But I, I don't think in terms of how do I persuade them? What, how should I tweak this message to persuade them, right? To me, that's not really my role as a scientist who's communicating. Now, of course, as a scientist, I could entirely justifiably join an advocacy group. And then I might think more about persuasion rather than because that's you're now thinking, I've decided to become an advocate. I'm going to try and persuade people about something, right? And then you might think more in terms of, you know, but I haven't really done that, right? I've tried to stick on the side of, look, I'm a scientist. I'm communicating publicly. It's clearly important. I really hope people take it seriously. I really think there's things we should be doing. But I'm driven first and foremost by trying to say things that I can support by evidence that's scientifically correct or scientifically reasonable, and not by how do I get a message across that will persuade people. You know, that that's not really the way I look at this. Now, I don't object to other people doing that. If you're an advocate, clearly you've already got a plan, clearly you've got a position, clearly you're trying to advocate and persuade people, but that's a different role, I think. So I kind of often wish people would distinguish between sort of, you know, maybe scientists who are engaging publicly are probably slightly cautious about thinking of how they tailor the message. Oh, no, well, that's not quite true. You always think about the audience, but you're always constrained by saying, you know, there's certain things I have to, you know, say that are, that are correct. I can't just say anything. Advocates who maybe will go a bit further, you know, they might choose to highlight the, the worst case scenarios all the time because they think that's effective. Others may choose to be optimistic all the time because they think that's effective, you know, whereas as a scientist, you try to provide caveats and use more careful language and think more about, can I defend what I'm saying? If somebody questions it, can I go to a source and say, look, no, this is what the source is. This is what the evidence indicates. And so I think that's the perspective I come from. One of the interesting things that we've seen over the last couple of years is that both with climate and with COVID, we have two areas where we have a science-led major issue. I mean, everyone's been talking about precious little else for the last couple of years. Arguably, there's been some blurring between the lines, dividing the role of scientist and the role of advocate. And we do have, within the climate science community and the epidemiologists, some names who we associate with a more activist mindset and profile. And we've had SAGE advising government on the pandemic and many of its members forever on the media. And we've had talk about a climate SAGE. Have we now got to a stage where the very clear position that you just outlined, which is what I always traditionally understood and supported as the role of the scientists, but he has actually wandered into this grey area between science and activism. And is that a problem? Um, so maybe I should maybe I should clarify what I said a bit more, maybe, because I agree there's a grey area. And I, I don't think it's a problem, really. Um, I think people just have to be honest, right? So if I'm... I will often say something like, I think we should cut... My opinion is that we should do more to cut emissions, right? And I do think that. But that's my opinion as a citizen or a parent or... a son of someone, you know, as somebody else, right? Um, and then I might back that up with something that's scientific, where I think when I start saying science, so I don't, I don't think that we should think of, of there being this necessarily a dividing line. I do think that scientists approach it from one side of that line, where they try to, you know, maybe put the evidence up front to back up maybe when they do express an opinion. Um, and then, of course, advocates might be thinking much more about how to persuade people about a specific policy. Um, I, you know, for example, I tend to keep things quite general. I, I don't have strong views about solar or wind or nuclear or whatever, right? You know, that, that those are solutions, right? Um, and I'm not an expert at which one is best in which scenario. I do think we should be thinking about implementing them, though, right? <laughs> you know, I do think we should be. Well, yes. Yeah. yes. So, 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 so in a sense, that's advocacy, but it's quite general advocacy. It's not specific advocacy. And so I think that as long as scientists are quite clear about, you know, what they're saying, when they're expressing an opinion, 
when are they trying to present some evidence? I, I don't really see a problem with that. Um, I, it is tricky though, I agree. And there are some who go much further, some who try very hard not to. I, I do think you've got to be careful of thinking that you can be completely objective in the public sphere, even as a science communicator. It's just not possible, I don't think, right? So I think it's worth being aware that, you know, the reason that some people might be engaging in this discussion is because they think it's societally important, because they think we should be taking it more seriously, right? So that in itself is a form of advocacy. If we, if we were being pure scientists, we might just publish papers and go to conferences and leave it alone. So, which is not what we're doing, right? We're engaging publicly. So there's always going to be that gray area. Um, and and I, th I think it's Gavin Schmidt who has quite a nice quote that I can't remember about how you simply cannot be completely, you know, you, you cannot simply not advocate, right? As soon as you're engaging publicly, you're effectively presenting a message of some kind, right? You're essentially trying to do something. Um, and we should be open about that, I think. If you look at where things are most polarised in this regard, obviously the United States, there's a very strong case that some people make about how the form that scientific advice on COVID has taken has been extremely adaptable depending on the political context. And the example that was most visible out of many was the way that if you wanted to protest against, I don't know, lockdowns, you were accused by scientists and doctors of engaging in a super spreader event. But if you wanted to gather in large numbers to protest racism and police violence, then the same scientists, the same medical establishment, not only said it was OK, but they actually encouraged it. And of course, people on one side of the divide in the US looked at that and it just confirmed for them that... This wasn't really science going on here. It was politics by another name. It wasn't an entirely unreasonable conclusion given those circumstances. And once you've created that impression, it's kind of hard to pull back from that. Now, we're not exactly in that situation in the UK, certainly not on climate. We have a political setup where we have a Conservative Party that's committed to net zero by 2050. The principle of that is a point of agreement with all of the opposition parties to the annoyance of some, of course. So in principle, we have that, and the politicos can then debate like cats in a bag about the details of how you achieve it. They can challenge each other on the details of policy. But we still seem to be in the old mindset. When people try to hold the political proposals to scrutiny over cost or effectiveness or whatever it is, and cost is a real issue. I mean, we just spent a shed load of money on covid and we're much more in debt as a country than we were. But I see the scientists as well as the activists treating those sorts of questions as though we are terrified of any sort of kickback or debate means that we're necessarily going to end up in the American situation where you're at risk that the whole thing gets thrown into reverse. And that's what leads some of those scientists to behave like activists in a way that could hurt more than it helps. I don't know. What do you think? It's a good question, actually. Let me, let me think about that for a minute. Yes. So, I mean, I think a lot of people have said for a long time, I mean, okay, let me go back a few steps. So when I started engaging more deeply in this, it was very clear that what was happening was that people who opposed some kind of climate action were attacking the science, right? That's how they justified their position, right? So make the science seem uncertain, and that can then sort of support arguments against doing something, right? Um, I think that's sort of gone away now, at least not, there's no, no more, nowhere near as extreme, right? There's very few people who are public voices who dispute the basics, right? There might still be issues about whether they accept how much we can warm and extreme weather events and things like that. But in fact, the narrowing of this climate sensitivity range uh, in the latest reports, because it has taken away some of the lukewarmer type arguments because they've basically removed sort of a range that, that a lot of people said, oh, we could warm by this much. Now we're kind of saying, well, we probably won't warm by that much. So, so in some sense, that sort of, I guess, attacking or criticizing or, or disputing the sciences is much less prevalent. And a lot of people have said, well, that's great because now we should be talking about solutions. And I agree, that is where we should be, right? We should be talking about how we solve that. And maybe there is an element now that now we've got there, people are worried that, you know, the, the discussion about solutions is now just another way to avoid doing anything. Um, and certainly there is this one concern, which I do share um, about net zero. Now, I, I'm perfectly comfortable with the concept of net zero, right? I think that that's basically what it is. You know, if we want to stop climate change, we've got to get emissions to net zero, right? And this, this sort of simple way, I guess, in the physics perspective, not in the 
actually doing it perspective is stop emitting, right? That's what you do, right? Now, you can, of course, then say, well, actually, we can't stop all emissions. Now we've got to find a way to capture some of what we emit. And that's where the, the sort of net comes in, right? So you have a negative part and a positive part. And as long as you can get them to balance, we get to zero. And one of the big concerns, I guess, at the moment is that people are designing these net zero pathways that aren't actually going to get us to zero, that you, your, your negative part isn't really negative. It's going to be, let's plant trees, and then you discover that there aren't, isn't enough space for them. So, so there is that concern where, where there's a real worry, which I think is genuine that we will, or certain groups will develop pathways that they claim are net zero that aren't. I guess there's the concern that the cost will be used as an argument against doing anything rather than as a way of developing a more effective net zero pathway, right? So I think that's one of the other concerns. Um, but I, I do agree with you completely that, that the discussion should be moving much more in that direction about constructive discussions about how we solve this, how, what do we do? How do we do it fairly? How do we, you know, how do we do it cost effectively? You know, how do, do we rely on negative emissions or do we aim for just simply emission reductions or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's always interesting to me how much that discussion ends up being a values discussion disguised as a science discussion. So, for example, one of the things the journalists will immediately go to when talking about climate change, really annoyingly from my point of view, and of all the possible questions of how to decarbonise an economy, they immediately go to meat and flying as though those are the only things that matter. And of course they're interested in those because they're things that are highly visible to the lives of their audience, which obviously is going to matter to them. And they're right, the, the viewers of the BBC are going to be a lot less interested in how we make concrete, how we manufacture steel, than they are about the idea someone's going to tell them they can't fly on a holiday or eat a burger. But how those discussions are framed is based on values choices. We could say that our approach to climate policy will be to seek to reduce the impact of the things that people most value, to at least try to get it, that they can continue to enjoy those things in a decarbonised world. Or we could take the approach that says our policy of first preference is going to be to tell those people they should give those things up. And people who are inclined to the latter may well be people who, for whatever reason, they're vegan activists or whatever, they would want to do that anyway, but climate change gives them the opportunity to push that case and say that this isn't their values choice that they're pushing on you. It's just what the science says that we have to do. But of course, the science doesn't prescribe any policy. It can measure the effectiveness or otherwise of what you choose to do. But there are all sorts of pathways you can explore based on the choices that will fit the society as a whole, the values of that society. And there's always the science of psychology as well. How do you take people with you? How, how will you do best of that? Is it going to be giving people what they most value in a way that achieves net zero? Or are you going to present yourself as the power that defines what they should value? Because you have a pre-existing political platform that you want to push. So you can do this, you know, something must be done. This is something, therefore this must be done. And if you don't agree, then you're against science. We seem to be pretty much stuck in that sort of discussion. Yeah, I, I have. I'm, I'm in two minds about that one. I, I, when politicians say follow the science or they follow the science, that always worries me a little bit because it makes me think they're just going to find a scapegoat, right? Because ultimately, no political decision is defined by the science as such, right? There may be some obvious ones, but ultimately, you know, you present information and policymakers make a decision and they might make a decision that some of us think is silly based on the evidence, but you know, that's how it works. Right. And so I'm never that comfortable with say policymakers claiming to be following the science, because I am imagining that if it all goes horribly wrong, they will just say, well, it's not our fault. We, we listen to the scientists, right. When in fact, really it is your fault. You should be, you know, taking that information and making decisions on the basis of whatever other information you have, I guess. The, 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 in the public sphere, when it's an activist, I, I kind of have a, a, a slightly different view, which is that it's just a slogan and everything's a slogan in that sphere. So you can always criticize these things. And clearly when an activist is saying, I'm following the sciences, they're trying to say, you know, I've got this evidence behind what I'm saying. And, you know, um, so, so I'm a bit more comfortable with it in that sense. But I do agree with you that the sort of flight shaming or meat shaming or whatever isn't all, all that helpful. Um, I think, you know, we should be careful of, of that kind of sort of 
narrative where we start blaming people because they took a flight or because they ate a burger, uh, because it is, a, it, as you say, there are many other sectors that would have a much bigger impact on emissions if we tackled them than, say, flying, for example. On the other hand, if you want to impact your own personal emissions a lot, then eating less meat and not flying has a big impact on your personal emissions. I mean, not you personally, but as, as a person. If, if somebody said to me, you know, I do a, a, you know, you know, a, a sort of a, a, a flight, you know, so many flights a year, or I do a, a long distance flight every year, you know, and I eat lots of red meat, what can I do to emit less? You'd say, well, actually you could fly a bit less and eat a bit less meat, and that would have a big impact on your own emissions. It might not have a big impact on global emissions, but in terms of personal emissions, those are, as far as I'm aware, a big chunk of, of what makes up our own emissions, at least. Certainly flying is, maybe meat eating isn't, isn't quite as bad. So, so I, I find it a very tricky aspect that, and, and this is maybe rambling a little bit, but as a science communicator in the public sphere, I'm sometimes cautious of criticizing activist slogans because in doing that, that's itself a political statement, right? So I'm comfortable, if, they, if, if somebody sort of presents something that's just wrong, <laughs> you know, fine, I, I will jump in and say, no, that's not what the science says. But telling activists how they should promote their message, that's a slightly different thing. And if when you start trying to influence how activists message, you're almost making a political statement yourself, I think. And so there's this interesting balance between sort of trying to correct scientific misinformation in the public sphere and trying to influence the message that people are trying to get out there, because those are two slightly different things. I'm not sure if I've said that all that clearly, but you know, I, I'm very uncomfortable with some of the science that I see being promoted, both by, you know, advocates and say by, you know, people who oppose action, because they can be, I don't want to do a both sider because I'm not sure it's quite that symmetric, but so, some of the more extreme activist messages are wrong. Um, and I'm more than happy to step up and say, no, that isn't correct. We're not going to undergo runaway greenhouse warming. That isn't going to happen. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I'm well aware that if you're an advocacy group, you have a message and, and you're entitled to have that message. And, and uh, you know, I can't as a scientist say you mustn't have that message, right? That is That shouldn't be what you're advocating for, right? You know, that's unless I step into the advocacy sphere myself and say, well, actually, as a citizen, I don't like that, that particular um, activism. So I'm going to advocate for something different. I'm not sure if I've expressed that all that clearly, but, you know, that's, there is this interesting balance between trying to make sure that, that the sort of scientific information is correct while not being too sort of influential in terms of how activists should promote their own messages. I guess it's inevitable that at some level the science gets politicised. I'm a bit worried about some aspects of how it plays out, particularly in the role that social media has been taking. And by that, I mean the role that it's taking in policing what can and can't be said. I mean, obviously there's a line people that are urging actual violence or physical harm, they are across the line, we agree with that. But people have variable definitions of what might or might not cause harm, so it's not that easy. But then there's how the science gets used in some of that policing. So, for example, the Climate Feedback website. In principle, very useful website with panels of climate scientists ruling on misinformation from a scientific point of view. But then you get entries on there where it's not just about fact checking, like when Michael Schellenberger had an article being rated a while back when his book came out. And one of the issues that the response talked about was this question about whether or not we're currently in the middle of a sixth mass extinction. He'd quoted a number of authorities that said that we weren't, which is my understanding as well. There are yeah, some published authors who say that we are, but even the team that was writing that page didn't agree. They had one academic who said that we were, and he was the one that added a comment to say as much. And then you had people like Zeke Housefather who didn't say anything on that on the page. He admitted later on Twitter that he didn't agree with that point. So in other words, it was a point of genuine open debate within the scientific community. So you'd think that therefore it shouldn't be presented as a fact check. And particularly because climate feedback was then used by Facebook as a source to govern whether it censors content or not. 
And it's that sort of thing that makes people turn against the role of scientist groups in relation to those issues. Legitimate areas for debate being shut down by social media companies in the name of science. Now, I don't know, am I overreacting to one case or do you think that there's a danger there? I, oh, I do I do worry about the same thing. And I, I think we should err on the side of allowing people to say things that we think are wrong. I agree with you that there are certain things that we there should be lines that are fairly obvious, like, you know, actively promoting that we go and attack medical professionals because of things that shouldn't be acceptable. But, you know, I think, as you say, um, you know, th there are certain things about which there is still debate and we should be careful of of. Um, of, you know, censoring that when we just because you find a site that claims it's wrong. And then there's the general thing, as I suspect you're getting at, that you're giving a lot of power to social media sites, which I think is is also wrong. Um, you know, ideally, I mean, I, I guess that, the, the, you know, I think what always surprised me is I guess when I started, one of the reasons I started was reading blogs that I thought were simply wrong. And so I started a blog and also not being able to comment on their comment threads without being, being absolutely lambasted by the other commentators for being an AG, AGW alarmist or whatever other, um, but that wasn't such an unpleasant term. They used much worse ones than that. Um, I've had them all, and, believe and, me. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think what has surprised me a little bit is maybe how there isn't more within the academic community who go, yeah, this is all wrong. And you get more of a sort of a natural groundswell of objection to it, uh, to the point that there are some academic disciplines that, as far as I can tell, think this is all part of some healthy debate. And you think, well, in the sense that they're saying that, you know, they're arguing with mainstream science, it's a debate. But in the sense that they're presenting anything that has any real evidence for it, it's not. And so, you know, I'm not sure this is part of a healthy debate. And so I, I, I think I found it surprising that it's that, you know, there isn't more people who say, yeah, we these sites are fine, they should exist, but we really should be highlighting how what they're saying is wrong, rather than simply censoring them, which I think is not is not the right way to do it. I mean, of course, I get got accused of censorship a lot on my blog, because I had a pretty strong moderation policy to the point where, you know, sometimes you just go, I'm not posting that comment, because I've spent you know, many hours explaining why it's wrong and I don't wish to do it again. Therefore, I'm just deleting it. And people go, oh, censorship should be, oh, well, it's my site, right? You know, and my moderation policy said that, right? It's my site. So I get to decide what gets posted and what doesn't get posted. And if you don't like it, don't post Yes, it. it's not as though your blog is on the same level as YouTube and no, Facebook exactly. in terms of the right. public yeah, square yeah, yeah. aspect. But, but, I, but I mean, I'm hopeful maybe that they're trying to get the line right. Um, but yes, I do also worry about this. I mean, I believe there are even situations where some mainstream climate science stuff isn't allowed on Facebook because it's perceived as political. And you think, well, I don't think climate science is political. It's an important topic for politics, but climate science itself is just science. So you do have a bit of that as well. It's interesting. I do videos on all sorts of topics and I'm always drawn to the grey area issues where the companies are nervous in case you're suddenly going to start spouting dangerous conspiracy theory stuff. I've never yet had a video taken down by YouTube. I've covered issues identical to videos that have been taken down. And there seems to me to be an incredibly fine line. I mean, one of them might feature an advocate for, say, Ivermectin who is allowed to speak on that video without challenge. Then there'll be another video where the same person gets to speak again, but they get journalistically challenged and someone with a contrary view also gets included. And then both videos get taken down by YouTube. And then maybe the second one gets reinstated on appeal. But you know, there's no clear rules and it seems fairly arbitrary. And the excuse is always informed by the science. They're trying to prevent dangerous misinformation as depicted by the WHO or by climate feedback or whoever. Now, I don't know who should be making those decisions, but surely it shouldn't be the tech companies. Yes, I think you're right. It, it is very tricky. And I, I must have, it's not something I've thought about a great deal. I mean, I've, I've been very aware of, of this issue of trying to you know, how do you determine whether or not some information is credible? How do you determine if an expert is? And, and I mean, there are people with very, very good credentials who are accused of promoting misinformation, right? So it's a very tricky line to draw, right? How, you know, so 
And I mean, the COVID has classic examples of people who've got, had a lot of public criticism because of what they've said, and yet their credentials are, are, are excellent, right? So, you know, how, how do you as a member of the public decide? Um, I, I think it's a big issue, and I, I think it's an important issue. I, I tend to agree that I don't think we should be resolving it through social media. Um, if I was being highly controversial, I would say that there are academic disciplines that look at this and do an exceptionally bad job of understanding it. You know, that, 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 um, that there are disciplines that, that have a focus on this, and from what I've seen, have not contributed positively to resolving this issue in the slightest. And so maybe that's just an illustra illustration of how difficult it is to determine that, you know, that, that when you have contentious topics, you will have credible experts who take a contrarian view and how do you decide, you know, object that that is a contrary? Now, one thing that is true, I think, and if you so, is if you were then to embed yourself in that scientific community, you'd probably discover that virtually every other expert knows that that contrarian is spreading nonsense, right? But how do you then sort of quantify that in a way that convinces the public that you know this relatively prominent person who is a professor at this really, you know, influential, really, uh, you know big university, huge number of publications is actually not credible in that topic is very, very difficult. I have a general issue with us elevating people to public intellectual status. And there's a lot of people who make their names actually possibly saying very sensible things in one topic and then suddenly become very confident about talking about another. And maybe this is where the media could play a role is being more cautious about taking this person who's got a high public profile who's got a name for being, say, quite intellectual, and then deciding, let's talk to them about this other topic. Because I think you do get to a stage where some of these people will happily go and talk to you about anything and, and, and maybe don't understand some of these complex topics nearly as well as they think they do. Before the last couple of years, when we had whatever passed for normality then, you can get figures with all sorts of views and they would tend to get challenged either by the journalists who were interviewing them or by having other people on the same programs with credentials to put the other side. So only in the last couple of years where with both climate and with COVID, we've entered a situation where we have these major areas where it's held to be so important you carry the public with you. The mere facts of asking certain questions or expressing certain counter views gets called not just wrong now, but dangerous. I mean, literally, that label's thrown around social media so often now. That person is not just wrong. What they're saying is dangerous. And, you know, these are issues that have consequences. There are now people dying of COVID-19 who were persuaded by anti-vax content not to get vaccinated. And this is where you get your dilemma. And again, it becomes a values question. Because at what point do you accept that people have agency to take their own decisions, at what point do you decide the government should infantilise its own population by taking that out of their hands? Now, of course, using that term, infantilising them, that's a values-laden term in itself. But you get what I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So we had someone who died recently who had been sharing one creator's videos. And, you know, people turned on that creator saying, this was on you, you caused this with your dangerous speech. But, you know, this guy was someone who'd gone to Cambridge University. He was highly intelligent, highly articulate. And in this case, he made a judgment and it was wrong. Tragically so. It has consequences. But it was still his decision to make. I mean, do we give him agency, the ability to expose himself to whatever arguments are out there? Or do we say, no, even if you've been to Cambridge, although that shouldn't really matter, government will protect you from bad thoughts? Or do you say, no, what we should be doing is putting all of those arguments onto platforms where they can be contextualised, where they can be challenged and so on. By refusing to platform certain arguments and they find a platform anyway, they gain attractiveness for having been suppressed and those new platforms then present no challenge, no kickback to them. Which, you know, I think is a mistake because A, it's censorship and it's a mistake because it actually ends up making things worse. I mean, I don't know. What do you think? My gut feeling again not, not i mean this is sort of apocryphal maybe is that challenging this stuff in the media doesn't work right in the sense that a lot of these people who have public profiles are very good 
at presenting their arguments. And, you know, even, even I'm not, I don't want to say to just the general, even in my case, if I was listening to say, didn't know anything about a topic, it's quite possible I could listen to two people on some media platform, both of whom have good credentials, both of whom are presenting credible, what sound like credible arguments. And so it's very difficult in that kind of format to actually challenge it in a, in a, in a convincing way. What I would say where I think things did go wrong in climate for quite a long time in the UK is where you would have, and this happened time and time again, you would have a, 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 a sort of a, some climate related issue and they'd have a climate scientist and then a blogger. And of course, you know, why would you do that? If you can't, if you want to have a debate, why have you chosen this person who has literally no climate credentials at all, runs a blog? And in some cases, they'd be talking about running climate models. And you'd think you've never run a climate model. You've probably never seen a climate model, right? So, you know, we, we could choose to say, well, there's no dangerous ideas. We should talk about everything. But if you get to the point where the, the sort of dangerous idea is coming from someone who has no credentials, maybe you shouldn't have that, right? Maybe you shouldn't platform that person. If you can't find somebody with relevant credentials to present this alternative view, maybe that's the point at which you which you are more cautious about putting it on. There was another example, I think, where one of the big climate reports a few years back, as I understood, they couldn't find a single climate scientist in the UK to present alternative views. So they got somebody from Australia. And you think, well, if you've been through your entire country and you can't find somebody that you'd regard as an expert to present this alternative view, maybe that alternative view isn't something that the media should be presenting. So I, I kind of tend to think that way is, is you know, at least think about the, the people you're getting on and whether or not they really have the credentials to present these alternative views. It seems to me that comes down to the skill in the producers in framing the discussion yeah. in a way that goes to the heart of whatever the point of substance really is. And there's no doubt that they tend to be lazy. I mean, even now, yeah. in the days just after the IPCC report was launched, I saw that GB News was having a debate between global warming policy forum sceptic on the one hand and someone from Extinction Rebellion on the other. So you've got the two extremes, both of whom have a contentious relationship to the science in the actual report, which was left wholly unrepresented on the platform. Now, there's obviously a discussion to be had from the launch of that report. You'd probably want it anchored in what the report actually says and what its implications might be. This is a bit trite, but of course, you know, we've had this whole 97% of scientists agree, and it's probably a bit greater than that. And so you get these sort of cartoonish things where you say we should have 97, sci 97 scientists for every three sort of contrarians. And of course, that's not strictly how it should be done. But you do kind of think that if, you, if you're aware that there's this massive level of agreement about something within some research community or within some scientific community, then you know, you don't want to do 50-50 splits on how you present that, I think. You want to, if, you know, you want to make very clear in the media, I would argue, that, you know, this is the view that's held by a majority of relevant experts. There are some who hold this view <laughs> or something more like that. And I think for a long time in the climate context, that wasn't coming through in the media. There was an awful lot of sense that there's this balance. There's this kind of, some people think this and some people think that, rather than most people think this a few people think that. And I think that's something else that maybe people could be more, the media could do a better job of presenting is, is quite where does the balance actually lie if you were to sort of interview the scientific community. Of course, the danger is always then that you miss the distinctive voices who have got something interesting to say. I mean, one of the things I do on this channel, I started to ask questions like, what are the best counter arguments to this? Do they stand up to scrutiny? So I'd look into research in those areas you know, with an open mind to see what was valid and what wasn't. So, for example, people suggesting that the CO2 impact is saturated and additional emissions, therefore, wouldn't add to warming. So then look at the basis for and against that argument and then produce a video about it. And in doing that, when I looked at what some of the distinctive critics were saying, you know, you get the Bjorn Lomborgs, Michael Schellenberger, Roger Pjelk, Judith Curry, Matt Ridley. These are all people who have had some specific, what I think are some good arguments, often mixed in with some bad arguments or some cherry picking data or whatever. In the case of Lomborg, I did a video recently. As you know, I quoted your blog in that one. There was the essence of a good challenge. Uh, 
I mean, he cherry-picked figures. He'd misrepresented some figures. If you strip that away, the central question of which climate policies were actually good value for what they delivered was quite an important one. You could dismiss his figures and still feel that that question was worth asking with better figures. Now, maybe it can't be him that does the asking when he's pushed it to the extreme and used it to go touring the Fox News studios and used it as an argument saying that this isn't an important issue, we don't need to do anything about it. But if not him, then who? Because the challenges are important. When I was researching these arguments, I looked at what the climate science community was putting up in response to these challenges. And I often had to look really hard for points of substance because more often than not, they were just dismissing them out of hand making ad hominem, highly personal attacks, where because of what people have said in the past, they were held to be toxic. The arguments were ignored. People just say, oh, well, that's what you'd expect Matt Ridley to say. So nobody needs to dignify that with a response. And I ended up thinking, well, is there anybody who is a critic to some of the mainstream commentary to how this works? I I mean the core science, I mean all those interesting grey areas, the tipping point debates, the policy debates. Is there any critic that the climate science community is prepared to respect and say, OK, we think you're wrong about this and here's why, as opposed to, there he goes again. I find that strange because people who I respect on both sides, there doesn't seem to be a lot of respect that's shared across those divides. There isn't. And I mean, I think when I started this, so so the, the first tagline on my blog was trying to keep the discussion civil. In fact, it was keeping the discussion civil, and then I changed it to trying to keep the discussion civil. And I eventually took that off. And not that I tried to make it less civil, but a lot of these people, Lomborg, maybe even Schellenberger and a few others, have essentially promoted very, very similar arguments for a very, very long time. And I think there are lots of people who tried over the years to engage more constructively and just got frustrated by the fact that it all just gets brushed aside and the same argument gets presented again. And maybe you could argue, well, we should just deal with that and we should remain constructive and remain serious. And 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 and. But I think it just gets very frustrating for some people. It's also tricky. Uh, and I think one of the big problems I have with some of the, the arguments presented by those people is that what they say could be true, how they interpret that truth isn't necessarily obvious, right? So the standard thing of, look, you know, we've got so much better, so much more resilient with time at dealing with extreme weather events, which I, I no doubt is true, right? But we have the potential to really change the climate of this planet a lot. And so, you know, if we were just worried about, well, we're going to change it a little bit in the future, that'll be fine. We can cope with that. But that's not what people are worried about. They're worried about the possibility that we change the climate a lot, at which point are we really going to remain as resilient relative to the new climate as we have been? So, so it's, you know, the fact that we've, so I think nobody really disputes the idea that we've, we've got on average, because there are certainly still some really dreadful events today and lots of people suffer. So let's not, uh, you know, but, but yes, on average, we have become much more resilient. But can we maintain that? And I think that's the, the problem. And I think so people like Schellenberger and Lomborg will kind of almost claim that this is obvious that we can continue this, right? And in fact, I'm sure that they almost say it like that, right? You know, look at us, we're so brilliant. We can, you know, we can keep this going. And I'm thinking, I'm, we're not, the problem people have is I don't think we're convinced we can, because I think you're underestimating how much potentially warming the planet by four degrees will do, right? That is, that is going to be a very, very different climate to the one we're used to. And yes, we've, we've coped very well with the past century and, and done a lot of good things, but really, can we keep that going? And should we be blasé about, about the possibility that, that what we're doing could make a big change? Well, I think that's it, isn't it? I've had that discussion a number of times. They have a good point, which is that Human beings have been extremely adaptable in the past. We should expect that we will continue to be adaptable in the future. But of course, the things that we did in the past, none of those happened because we were complacent. I mean, they happened because we took the problem seriously, because we set about taking the appropriate action to tackle the problem. And of course, that's a rather different mindset to the one that just says, oh, well, you know, we'll sort it out eventually. Yeah. And of course, it... it largely ignores it, as you're saying, I think that, you know, there are many ways to sort this out, one of which is to actually 
limit how much we emit, you know, put alternative energy sources in, right? And the other one, of course, is we will have to continue developing resilience because, you know, we're in a new climate. We're going to continue to be in a changing climate for a while. Plus, there are huge parts of the world where it makes sense to develop resilience there anyway, just because they're not as resilient as, as other parts of the world today. And I guess the ethical question, which I think they gloss over is, and I'm pretty sure I saw one of them make this comment the other day about Bangladesh being able to do what the Netherlands has done. And you think, well, but we're almost, and, and I don't like the we word because of course it's very complex, but in a sense, it's the global North who's predominantly done a lot of the emitting is one of the reasons why sea levels are rising. So is it entirely fair to say to Bangladesh, it's possible for you to cope with these changes, but we're not gonna necessarily help you to do so, right? You know, so there is that other ethical question. Yes, maybe it's possible to, to maintain this resilience, but how fair is it to expect parts of the world to be investing an awful lot in infrastructure to deal with changes that they had very little to, you know, they, they contributed very little to making. And so there's that other aspect as well that I think is important to, some of those individuals have extremely good arguments that can get lost because of some of the other things they say. And that's what you've quoted there. So for Schellenberger, for example, one of these arguments, which, you know, isn't unique to him, of course, is how the fact that we've halved absolute poverty over the last few decades, it would be very easy for badly planned, badly implemented climate action to reverse that process. Because some of the most vulnerable people in the world really need sources of reliable, always on power. And in the short term in their situation, that often means fossil fuels. And if it can't be fossil fuels, then it still has to be sufficient, reliable and always on power or else it's just not going to work for them. Now, that's a perfectly good argument and a constraint that we should be adding to our terms for the task at hand. This isn't a one variable problem. It's not how do we get to net zero? It's how do we get to net zero while preserving what people value, while taking people with us, while helping to continue to bring people out of poverty and not to make their situation worse. Schellenberger's point that you're totally underestimating at the moment how vulnerable a lot of the poorest in society actually are to a sudden abrupt move away for them from fossil fuels. I think that's a valid point to be made, which I haven't seen being taken seriously because of some of the other things that he attaches it to, like the one that you just quoted. Yeah, and, and I, I think, I mean, you're right. Uh, and, and I think if you get into some more aspects of the climate debate, there are quite a lot of people who are trying to highlight fairness in the sense that it can't just be, let's slash everything now, or rather, you know, we've got to think about how do we cut emissions in a way that's fair. And it is something we probably don't discuss enough. But I think there are serious people who are, are quite comfortable agreeing that, that you know, there are, we, ha we have to think about how we do this in a way that's fair, that we don't end up doing more harm than good. I guess, you know, one thing that, and it's not quite the same thing, but something I, I think a lot of people think is, you know, imagine we'd taken this seriously in 1990 after James Hansen presented his big sort of, sort of evidence to the US Senate, right? We could have done this quite gradually and, and fine. And so I often think, you know, the big thing is to take it seriously. And I still think that there are people who aren't taking it seriously, despite what they say. And so my worry, I guess, is that we'll be in 10 years time, we'll be still be saying, oh, my goodness, it's got much worse. But oh, we can't do anything just yet, because of, you know, there's all these other factors, you go, yes, all those other factors are clearly there. But we've got to think seriously about how we deal, as you say, with climate change, while also trying not to, or while also allowing people to, to grow, to thrive, to, you know, get better lives. It's a very, very tricky issue. Um, and, and, and I guess that's partly why, I mean, I, why when I come at it from my perspective as a scientist, it is, look, here's the bottom line is we're causing climate change. And the way to stop it is to, is to get emissions to net zero, right? And, and that's the tricky discussion we should really be having. And, and we shouldn't really, well, again, we don't want to censor people, but the debate about whether we're having it, whether it's serious, should probably be minimized. And the debate should be moving, as I think you were suggesting earlier, into how do you get to net zero in a way that's reasonable, fair, doesn't do more harm than good, and, and, and you know, and doesn't cost, well, it's going to cost money, but doesn't cost more than it needs to cost. Um, so, so I agree, those are important issues, but and and 
I guess with Schellenberger, people's perception is that it's it's being used in a way that isn't necessarily entirely based on solving climate change. It's based on maybe avoiding solving climate change, if that's the right way to put it. But maybe that's a little bit unfair. Yeah, yeah. I've, obviously I've named a number of individuals and they're not all the same in terms yeah. of how they approach these things. But no, just right. in terms of yeah. how they were treated by the broader science community, where you'd expect challenge to be an ongoing and a valued process. Well, we've covered a lot of territory. My final question really on this then, just generally, what are your hopes for what will happen in the next decade if things go as well as they possibly could? Well, in the next day, I mean, I, I guess the hope, I guess there is a real concern that as we head towards two degrees, the impacts will get much, much worse than they've been at, say, one degrees, right? And if we want to avoid that, then we really do need to make not just stop emissions from going up, but actually have them start going down within the next decade. Again, I do share the concern as to how do you do that in a way that's fair, that doesn't end up you know, limiting other areas' ability to grow and thrive and improve their lives and things like that. So, so my ideal would be, you know, the developing the developing world continues to develop and we manage to start cutting emissions in the next decade and we, you know, develop resilience. But it is a very, very difficult problem. And But I guess the worry I have is if we don't do that, then we're screaming towards two degrees and above. And maybe we'll be lucky and, and we'll be able to maintain the levels of resilience and improve them. But, but there's every chance we won't be and we will discover that we should probably have done more. I suspect we're always going to discover we should have done more. I just hope we do enough to, to not regret it too much, I guess. But uh, it, it is a very, very tricky. I guess my real hope is that we, <laughs> within the next few years, we move into a stage where, as I think you're suggesting, we, we spend much more time constructively talking about how we solve this and much less time arguing about the details of whether we're doing it or whether we should be trying to solve it. Ken, that has been really interesting. Fantastic discussion. If people want to find you and see what you're up to on social media, where should they look? Well, I guess I'm at There's Physics on Twitter. And then, as you said, my blog is and then there's physics.wordpress.com. So those are the two main ones. And there'll be links to both of those in the video description. Yeah. Ken, thanks so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, thanks for inviting me. That was great. Thanks, Melvin. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself. So.